The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents Bible Questions. Are Matthew 7.21 and Acts 2.21 in conflict? Hey everybody, I hope this is one of the videos that you all end up liking because it's genuinely one of my favorite things to do. Not only am I getting a chance to answer a question that somebody sent in, but I get the chance to actually uh, look into the Bible and doctrines a bit more, which is something I've always liked. Uh, there's, there's a screenshot you'll see in a minute, which is... Uh, from the eSword tool that I use whenever I've studied the Bible. Uh, I may, I know I've talked about it before, I may actually do a, a whole video kind of going through it and showing how I use it. But to start with, let's read the two verses in question. First, Matthew seven twenty one, which says, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Uh, which is basically a doctrine saying, hey, not everybody who wants to be saved is going to be saved. You actually have to do the things that God wants you to do, uh, which ties into a really complicated subject about uh, salvation with or without works. Uh, and that's a video for another time. The verse in Acts 2.21 says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so in Matthew 7, 21, you basically have uh, Jesus saying, hey, when that time comes, not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, is really uh, amongst the saved. They're not amongst the chosen. They're not amongst those that will be ushered into heaven. It's not just enough to say it. And yet this passage in Acts, which is Peter giving a sermon uh, at Pentecost, says that it shall come to pass that whosoever, everybody, shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, at first blush, these uh, could absolutely appear to be in conflict. And as is the case with most questions about religious doctrine, Christian doctrine, and I suppose questions about the law, when somebody says, are these two passages contradictory? The answer is, well, it depends. Maybe, maybe not. Um, by the way, here's the screenshot I talked about. This passage here, uh, Peter's Sermon at Pentecost from Acts 2, 14 through, I'm going to go through 25. I'm actually going to read that entire passage for commentary because while it doesn't focus entirely on whether or not there's a contradiction here, it does give us uh, some really interesting stuff to talk about. This screenshot was taken as I highlighted. You can see there in, in, in verse 21, and it says, and it shall come to pass that whosoever, and there are three Greek words there, uh, 3956, 3739, and 302. And those three words together get translated as whosoever. And the first one, which is the one I've highlighted there, 3956, is uh, pos, which includes all forms of the declension, or declension, apparently a primary word, all, any, every, or the whole. This is kind of the Bible dictionary goes through and says, here's this Greek word, and here's how it's actually used. And so the question then becomes, what's being talked about in each of these passages? And are they really talking about the same? Because um, salvation is a difficult topic, even for believers. As a matter of fact, it's one of those many topics within Christendom that has its own name, soteriology, which is the study of what is required for salvation. There was a, a young individual on TikTok the other day who, who managed to, in, the, in an attempt to teach and preach a, a sermon, completely misunderstood uh, a passage in Exodus about an angel and whether or not it would forgive sins. But because he's young and studying this in English and a Christian, when he read it, it was like, oh, here's an angel that won't be forgiving sins, but it could have forgiven sins. And then went on to give a completely, um, I mean, it's not even within orthodoxy that angels could forgive sins. And he completely overlooked the fact that this is, this is essentially an English idiom, which means I'm sending my messenger. Don't mess with this messenger because he's not going to take your crap. Uh, he's not, you know... And, and God's this way a lot of times in the Old Testament. Maybe I'll go through some of those passages, but I want to go through this passage from Acts uh, because the concern here is that Matthew 7 is saying not everybody who calls upon the Lord will be saved. 
And Acts 2, 21, seems to imply that everyone who calls upon the Lord will be saved. The problem here is that it could be argued, and probably would be, I don't know, I'd have to put my, I'd have to talk to one of my Christian friends, but it could be argued that what Jesus is talking about is um, salvation uh, to heaven, uh, forgiveness of sins and transgressions and, and eternal life. And that what Peter's talking about is in these final days when, when people are calling out to God, they will still be able to do that. It's incredibly difficult because we're talking about copies of copies of translations of copies of oral histories that are in dead and dying languages. It's incredibly difficult to say, oh, here's, th this is what this means. And that's why there are thousands of different denominations that all uh, disagree on all sorts of points of doctrine. That's how you get a Baptist church, a Lutheran church, a Catholic church, Episcopalian, et cetera. They're subtle little things, and some of them are bigger than others. I would say, and, and I'm sure this will irritate some of my Christian friends who want there to be a contradiction everywhere, that I don't necessarily see a clear contradiction between Matthew 7.21 and Acts 2.21, even though I understand how people reading it could reach that conclusion. I think there's a bigger problem here, and that's why I'm going to read um, this section from Acts. So we're in Acts chapter 2, verses 14 through 21. And this is with commentary, so I will, I will try to, to make it obvious when I'm speaking as me. Chapter 2, verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted his voice, and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. So verse 14 is, hey, everybody, listen up. I can shorten the, maybe I should do like my own Bible commentary where I just, you know, shorten things up. So verse 14 is, hey, everybody, listen up. Verse 15 says, for these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing is but the third hour of the day. So no kidding, verse 15 is him saying, I know this is going to sound like I'm drunk, but it's barely noon. I, I know that there, there are people who, who view this as like just a little joke, like, oh, let me put a humor in here. Hey, everybody, listen up. I got something to tell you. I know it's going to sound like I'm drunk, but it's barely noon. But this is in the Bible, and it's important uh, for reasons I'll get to in a minute. Verse 16 says, uh, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So right off the bat, he's going to be quoting or referencing what Joel had to say. Verse 17 says, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. So verse 17, uh, after saying, hey, here's what Joel told us. In the end days, you're going to see all kinds of wild stuff. There's going to be prophecies and dreams. Verse 18 says, And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So basically, in, in this end times, sort of in the last days, God's going to bestow his spirit on the world, and there's going to be prophesying all over the place, which I suspect might be why there's so many people trying to pretend like they have a gift of prophecy because uh, they want it to be the end times, and they want to show that they are the chosen. Um, continuing on, And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor and smoke. I don't know how those are signs, blood and fire and vapor and smoke, but that's what it says is going to happen. Verse 20, The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood. Before that, great and noble day of the Lord come. Verse 21, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the verse in question from my viewer. And verse 22, ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Verse 23, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken 
and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, verse 24, whom God hath raised, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. And then verse 25, which is where we'll end, for David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is given he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. This passage, and I defy anyone to say how this is not fair, starts off and say, Peter says, hey, everybody, listen up. I got something to say. I know I'm going to sound drunk, but it's still early in the day. Um, in the last days, God's going to bestow his spirit on the planet, and people are going to prophesy in his name, and people will see visions. And I will show you great wonders with blood and fire and smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the day that the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls out for the Lord shall be saved. Now, that, <laughs> first of all, uh, it doesn't change the fact that it sounds drunk. Saying it's early in the day is absolutely no rebuttal at all to the, to the claim that you sound drunk. Um, but what we see here is that their proof that they weren't drunk was that it was a third hour day, which doesn't prove anything. So these same preachers don't understand proof or evidence any more than, than they do now which is why it continues on to just say, here's what's going to happen. There's no presentation of any evidence. There is just, let me cite the authority. Here's what Joel said. Here's what David said. It's claims without evidence, one after the other. And then it gets down to the, ye men of Israel, hear these words of Jesus of Nazareth, man approved by God among you, by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, and as ye yourselves know. So their authority here is, you guys know this is real. You guys know this happened. And we still see that to this day. It's like the people who read the Bible don't understand that perhaps in the first century, you might still be talking to someone who might have some of these events within their living memory. But it's unlikely that who, the people who Peter is talking to would have had any specific knowledge of any of this, nor would it be likely that they would be convinced necessarily that this was God. Because if somebody witnessed all that and knew all that, why would you be telling them about it and saying that's you know proof he's God? He was raised from the dead. You know he was raised from the dead. Well, no, they don't. Who, who are you talking to? But modern day apologists do the same thing. I just watched a TikTok the other day with uh, Greg Locke saying atheists don't exist. And I can't count the number of times debate opponents in formal debates and callers to shows have been the, there are no such things as atheists. Matt, you know, you know, deep in, you know that you know that you know that you know that God is real. And I'm like, no, I don't. And ever, the more you say it, the more drunk you sound. What we see from this passage is that while soteriology is a study of what must one, one must be do to be saved, according to Christianity, uh, is there a conflict between those two passages? I don't know. It depends on who you ask. I don't necessarily see one, but I understand how one a case could be made for one. And I think that the confusion here is, once again, if God is not the author of confusion, then God is not the author of this. This is, whether or not I think it's a contradiction, it's a serious issue that Christians would have to uh, address. But it just also shows that preachers have been preaching and using the same vapid propaganda methods for a very, very long time. They walk in and say, hey, I'm going to tell you this. You know it's true. You know in your heart it's true. And I'm going to cite these. I'm going to cite the Bible, which cites Peter, citing Joel. I mean, literally, this is them citing the Bible, citing Peter, citing Joel and David. And then I'm going to tell you that you know it. And nowhere is there actual evidence presented for it. And this is what is supposed to be compelling. This is what passes for um, serious religious thought and instruction. Because when we go to the Bible, that's the only original or even close to original source material that they may have. And so they're stuck with it. And so they're stuck with Peter either making a joke about how we sound drunk, but it's too early in the day, or recognizing that the majority of people look at these claims as if they are irrational hallucinogenic-induced, drunk-speak, etc. And if their response to that is to say, no, 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 here's the evidence, that would be cool. 
And if their response to that would be to say, you know, hey, I understand why you might think that, but here's why it's not the case. And then presented evidence, that would be cool. But to just say, hey, we sound drunk uh, and it's way too early in the day. Well, just remember, even for first century Christians, it's five o'clock somewhere. See you guys next time.